thanks for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some uh, work uh, we did a few years ago, actually, while I was still at Bosch. Uh, I'm currently at uh, Harvard uh, as of uh, three weeks ago. And um, uh, I just want to give you one example in thermoelectrics, and if I have time, maybe in ionic transport, in uh, some effort how we uh, looked at uh, design of materials based on transport properties. Um, basically, uh, the work that we typically do starts with designing methods for predicting uh, properties of materials. In this, in this case, it's ionic, electronic, and thermal transport. And then uh, trying to set up these methods in a way that they're uh, automated easily and can be put on uh, sort of high throughput frameworks, and then generate a lot of data and then learn from the data to find some design rules and trends and uh, then design better materials. So in the case of thermoelectrics, we were looking for materials to capture waste heat in uh, automotive systems, so basically something that would go in the exhaust gas manifold and uh, uh, convert some of that waste heat into useful electricity and feedback into the car. Um, and uh, the principle behind uh, thermoelectric materials is uh, really the Seebeck effect, uh, which is illustrated uh, here. Uh, for metals, nothing fancy, sort of nothing special goes, goes on because uh, the density of states is very high. Uh, and uh, the Fermi Dirac distribution, regardless of how sort of wide it is, regardless of the temperature, it doesn't really shift the chemical potential of the electron, which uh, is very different than a semiconductor where you're very sort of close to the uh, to the edge of the, uh, of the density of states where, depending on your temperature, your Fermi level can shift quite a bit. So this is the Seebeck effect. And the ratio is the Seebeck coefficient, which is essentially uh, the main ingredient for thermoelectric performance. It's not the only ingredient. Um, the other ingredients are, uh, for good thermoelectric, are, of course, uh, electronic conductivity sigma, uh, so that you know, your material can actually conduct electrons and you can extract the current. Uh, there's also electronic thermal conductivity uh, in the denominator here and lattice thermal conductivity. Those uh, you want to be as low as possible because you don't want the uh, temperature gradients to relax uh, without producing any useful electricity. Right? So this is a, a figure of merit which we're trying to predict from first principles, from, uh, from ab initio calculations. And um, we're looking for better materials, obviously. Right? So the materials that we know today are in this diagram here. And some of them are good in terms of ZT, but they're not stable or they're very expensive. Other materials are better in terms of cost, but they're not good in terms of performance. So we were focusing on a material class that is uh, good in terms of stability and uh, decent in terms of performance, but was uh, particularly bad in terms of cost. So we're trying to optimize uh, the, the actual cost of the element. So trying to replace the composition with something cheaper. And the way we were approaching the problem uh, is uh, by solving the Boltzmann transport equation for electrons and also for phonons uh, to try to predict the conductivity so that we can then estimate the ZT. And the idea was to try to do it from first principles. And uh, the formalism of Boltzmann transport is, um, has been applied many times before for thermoelectrics because uh, some of the properties are easily computed, uh, like the band structure, for instance. In this case, uh, you could rely on the GW corrected band structure or, or just a regular uh, LD or GGA. And then you can plug in the velocities uh, for, the, uh, for the electrons, basically the slopes of the band structure, into this uh, 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 equation for the electronic conductivity, which comes from the Boltzmann transport uh, equation solutions. And you can do the same for uh, the Seebeck coefficient and then uh, 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 get something uh, just from the band structure for the Seebeck coefficient, because uh, what happens in that case is that the lifetimes of electrons essentially cancel out to first order. They don't cancel out in the electronic thermal conductivity and the electronic electrical conductivity. And this is a problem, right? So the lifetime uh, of the electron actually enters as a proportionality uh, constant in the, uh, in the electronic conductivity. So we really actually need to estimate it in order to predict thermoelectric performance. And this wasn't done before because it's very difficult uh, to estimate lifetimes of electrons. You need to know the scattering mechanisms. It's, it's way beyond just band structure calculations. So. Um, uh, this, is a, this is essentially an issue, is that um, using a uh, commonly sort of assumed constant relaxation time is really not appropriate, as we'll show, uh, uh, for, for predicting thermoelectric performance. It's okay for Seebeck, but not okay for, for electronic conductivity. So the idea was to try to con compute it from first principles. And the main transport dominating sort of mechanism at the higher temperature where thermoelectrics really operate is electron-phonon coupling. So the idea was to try to estimate the lifetimes 
just from the sort of uh, electron phonon uh, scattering matrix. And then uh, from the Fermi golden rule, you could essentially write down the lifetime uh, as a quantity that depends on the actual mode on the, uh, on the electronic state uh, and count all the scattering events and add them all up in, a, uh, in this uh, first order perturbation theory uh, and then try to compute the lifetime. The challenge with this approach is that it's doable in principle, uh, but it's very difficult in, uh, in practice because you need very fine meshes for electronic and phononic uh, states. So the K and the Q meshes need to be very fine for this to converge. So this approach really uh, has an issue. Uh, it's, it's doable for simple materials. So it actually does uh, quite well, as I'll show for graphene. This is something that was done by Chon Pan, Chon Pan, uh, in a couple of years ago. Um, this is graphene uh, as a function of uh, uh, temperature and doping level. Uh, and it's a very simple material with two atoms per unit cell. So you can actually do this electron phonon coupling calculation uh, in a brute force way and integrate these uh, large K and Q meshes. It's really difficult to do for a practical material. So we were trying to find a way to shortcut uh, the calculation to somehow average it in a, in, a, uh, in a simplified way so that we can actually access real materials from ab initio to compute lifetimes of electrons in more complex semiconductors. So to go beyond sort of idealized uh, materials like silicon and graphene. And the approach we took was to try to uh, move the integration, which is complicated in K and Q space, uh, in momentum space, and move it into energy domain. So replace some of these KQ dependent quantities, like the electron phonon coupling matrix, uh, with, a, with the one that depends only on the energy. So essentially remove the directionality dependence, in a way, from the, uh, from the integral, and also replace the phonon dispersions by just sort of uh, a uh, simplified model where we have uh, optical uh, bands with some three frequencies that don't depend on the, uh, on the momentum vector, which is a, a good approximation at higher temperatures where your optical phonons really dominate the scattering. So the resulting expression is much simpler because uh, you only have to sort of compute the density of states, and this whole momentum space integration becomes much, much easier to do. So you uh, cut the computation cost by uh, four orders of magnitude compared to uh, a more complicated brute force integral uh, with momenta, and you have to do integration uh, also using Vanier interpolation, which is another non-trivial step if you want to scan many materials. So how to get those Vanier functions is still a little bit tedious. So this is a method that allowed us to automate and simplify the whole uh, calculation. Um, and we wanted to check how well it does relative to the uh, actual you know, fully exact sort of interpolated momentum space integral, and it actually turns out to be okay, which is a bit surprising, and we still don't understand fully sort of the limits of this kind of approximation, but it does show that um, if you look at properties like electronic conductivity for some of these materials and compare the EPW, which is the one interpolated uh, momentum space integration scheme with EPA, which is this averaged energy scheme that we developed, uh, it does very well, especially uh, it does okay compared to experiment at higher temperatures, which is encouraging, which means that basically you are capturing uh, the correct uh, scattering from the phonons, which dominates at high temperatures. You do quite poorly at low temperatures because your defects actually uh, dominate the scattering and you don't expect, of course, the model to work very well at lower temperatures because of that. So that's fine. Um, and for the SIBA coefficient, uh, it's all uh, quite, quite in good agreement already. Uh, again, because the lifetime is not a very important factor for the Seebeck coefficient. So this graph here, this uh, set of graphs, shows that the uh, electronic lifetime is actually quite sensitive to energy. So this commonly used uh, constant uh, relaxation time approximation where you just assume, assume tau uh, for the electrons is a constant, and for sort of a material uh, you don't capture the, um, the energy dependence. This is the blue line here. Basically, you assume a constant regardless of energy. And uh, also, in practice, people usually assume the value for this tau to be something typical of you know, a semiconductor, something on the order of a uh, femtosecond. Um, it's actually also not a constant as a function of material composition. So for instance, here, the best fitted tau is about an order of magnitude different from the best fitted tau uh, in this material. And these are sort of two different compositions here. So we both don't capture the energy dependence as well as composition dependence, which is a problem. But with these methods, uh, with either EPW or EPA, you are able to get a very physically meaningful uh, picture. And also, notice how uh, this resembles the density of states. 
essentially. So that sort of hints at the possibility of having these simplified models for the electronic lifetimes that don't have to actually maybe take into account the entire complexity of scattering, but somehow these sort of models are uh, uh, largely sort of proportional to the density of states. Okay, so we have the scheme, right? So then for every material, what we need to do to optimize thermoelectric performance is to uh, really sweep with respect to the Fermi level, right? Because uh, as you uh, get away from the, from the edges, from the bent edges, your electronic conductivity, of course, increases because you have more carriers. And your CBEC coefficient will die off because of this metallic regime that I showed in the beginning is not good for CBEC. So there's really a trade-off, and you really have to optimize this um, uh, carry concentration to find the sweet spot for thermoelectricity. So for every material that we actually design, we have to perform this uh, sweep. And this is particularly convenient with the APA scheme because all you have to do is just change one parameter and out comes the property. So in this case, ZT, as a function of uh, chemical potential of electrons, uh, really peaks at, at these edges. And this is how you find the best optimal point for the thermoelectric performance. And we have to do it for every material. So in the end, the workflow uh, for ZT optimization starts with you know, phonon calculations, electron calculations, looking at the couplings, producing uh, electronic and thermal conductivities, and then sweeping everything with respect to the chemical potential and find the optimal uh, composition. And we started doing this for lots and lots of materials, first narrowing down by uh, composition within the half hoisler family to only select the semiconducting ones and throw out the metallic ones. And then from the, from the pre-screening, then we ended up with a set of 28 interesting materials that uh, essentially uh, produced uh, properties like this. So we basically have, for lots of these different alloys in half hoistler family, we have these ab initio predictions of ZT. Um, and before I get to the ZTs, I'll just mention that the electronic lifetimes, you can see here, already you know, from this plot, you see there are two orders of magnitude variation between different materials. Uh, so this also tells you that it's very, very important to get the lifetimes right if you want to optimize the thermoelectric. So um, once we have the lifetimes, you can also predict the mean free path of electrons. And the mean free paths are in this plot here. And you see that they're not very long. Actually, they're, they're quite short, uh, which means that the uh, phonons are very effective at scattering electrons, even uh, on the length scales, let's say, 10 to 100 nanometers. What that means in practice is that uh, it's actually a very good idea to nanostructure these thermoelectric materials. And this is actually true uh, experimentally. Uh, because uh, when you nanostructure, you can't really go to 10 nanometer grains. You usually have like a micron and maybe 100 nanometer, a few hundred nanometer grains. So your scattering uh, of electrons already happens within the grains. So the grain boundaries don't add any extra significant contribution there, but they are very effective at scattering phonons because phonons in these materials happen to be very long, uh, long propagating uh, modes that are hard to, hard to scatter because of the nature of the material. So actually, these materials benefit quite a bit. Um, as a result, you only have to worry about the electronic transport property when you predict better materials in this family. So we predicted a bunch of these materials, and then um, uh, a few months later, our experimental partners synthesized a few of these. Uh, in this case, this is uh, a new alloy, uh, niobium iron and simonide, which was synthesized. Uh, and uh, it actually shows better power density than the state-of-the-art half hoistler material that was known until that uh, discovery. And, um, uh, the more important thing is that we were able to reduce the cost. So from $350 per kilogram, it's now about 40 just because the elements of hafnium and zirconium are not in the composition. So you have a much cheaper material. And also the turnaround time was under two years for sort of method development uh, screening and then a few months for the experimental synthesis. So this is sort of an example of how you could rapidly get, get uh, better materials if you have some uh, more predictive tools in your, um, in your toolbox. Um, just to take this a little bit further and uh, start asking questions, you know, what can we do even faster uh, in terms of screening materials? Can we find some descriptors uh, without having to do all this electron phonon coupling, lifetime calculations? Uh, can we find some properties that we can predict easily that correlate with the final uh, uh, material performance that we are interested in? So this is in the domain of sort of finding design rules and descriptors. Um, that we can start extracting from the data that was computed. And very briefly, here, what we found is that uh, 
for all the materials we've computed, for all these uh, 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 tens and tens of uh, half Hoistler alloys in particular, the Seebeck coefficients at optimum concentration of electron, uh, basically at optimal doping, they're all pretty much the same. So we couldn't really distinguish materials based on the Seebeck coefficients. They're all about 200, say 175. What we did find interesting is that ZT in particular was mostly uh, sensitive to the electron effective mass. And later on you could write down sort of parabolic band models and rationalize why that is the case. But uh, it's interesting that you can never find a very good material at very heavy electron, uh, heavy, uh, you know, uh, effective masses of electrons, but you can find very good ZTs at very light uh, effective masses. So this is not a perfect correlation by any means, it's more of a classifier uh, in terms of descriptor language. So uh, this is one of those most useful ones we found, and we've, we've checked you know, band gaps and phonon velocities and so forth and so on. This is very simple to compute, but at the same time gives you uh, a filter, right? So if you find the material here, that you don't even hope to get a good ZT, and if you uh, find the material here, then you actually can do more detailed calculations. So it's, it's more of a filter and uh, uh, helps you to screen materials much faster than trying to do electron phonon coupling for everything. So um, to summarize, uh, I guess, the, uh, the story on thermoelectrics, um, I just want to emphasize that we're getting to a point where these calculations of ab initio transport properties, especially for electrons and for phonons, are getting more predictive. And with some simplifications and some sort of practical shortcuts, uh, you can now design and uh, uh, study complex materials for practical technological applications. And the key really is to find uh, you know, what uh, simplifications to make so that you can access much, much more complicated systems. Um, we also you know, emphasize that the electronic lifetime is quite sensitive to composition and to the energy, uh, so you actually need to include it explicitly in the, in the calculation of, of thermoelectric performance. And uh, we still don't know how much detail really to put into these calculations. It could be that we can get away with much, much less work actually to predict at least approximately thermoelectric performance. So this question, you know, how much complexity, how much detail is really needed is really an open question at this point. So uh, I'll switch to another topic, uh, which is more an ionic transport, just to illustrate some of the uh, ideas uh, uh, there, uh, and to give you also a sense of what kind of sort of tools might be useful for designing ionic conductor materials. And this is more in the domain of solid state batteries. So this is now an energy storage where we are uh, looking for materials to transport ions in a safe way from the anode to the cathode without causing explosions. And um, here we need a solid an inorganic crystal that has very, very high ionic conductivity at room temperature. This is the design goal here. And um, I'll start with a system that is completely unrelated, and just to illustrate some of the interesting concepts that are emerging in this direction. Um, this is a model of a uh, antiferromagnetic uh, Ising model on a triangular lattice. It has nothing to do with ionic transport at first glance, um, but it's a very interesting system uh, because of a, a quantity I guess, of a, of a property here called frustration. Frustration means you can't really find a very uh, well-defined ordered state. The system doesn't know what to do locally because of the competing interactions. And in this case, imagine trying to put uh, antiferromagnetic spins in a triangle, and you really can't uh, because if you put up here, down here, that you don't know if up or down goes here since either way it will give you the same energy. So you have in the end sort of this indeterminacy, this frustration, and if you replace now spin uh, by uh, occupancy, by doing sort of a variable transformation, you could map into, into a lattice gas model. And this is sort of the two scenarios equivalent to this one here, right? So basically you can choose whether to put a lithium ion on the site or not, right? And it gives you the same energy. So if you look at, uh, in the case of this 2D antiferromagnetic triangularizing model, uh, if you look at the ground states, you immediately see there is a very high degeneracy of the ground state in this case at half filling, essentially where you're trying to sort of uh, put up and down spins equivalently. Um, but that's not true if you're at one third filling. And this is something that's very important to understand in frustrated systems. Uh, you only have frustration uh, in this sense only at particular carry concentrations. Here you do have a very well ordered ground states at one third where you actually just put every uh, and every sort of big hexagon, you put one lithium ion, right? So you actually have a very nicely um, low entropy state here. This has a very important implication for transport. If I show you the uh, electronic conductivity of this lattice gas, 
as a function of temperature. This is uh, important to understand what happens is that there are these phase transitions, especially at higher concentrations, that correspond to the possibility of having these highly ordered states like this one. What happens is essentially the system freezes as a function of temperature into these readily available low entropy states. And uh, it cannot freeze if you're frustrated. In fact, in this triangular model, uh, Gregory Vanier showed, before he, I think, got into Vanier functions, he showed explicitly that in a triangular model, antiferromagnetic ising uh, lattice cannot freeze at any finite temperature because of the frustration. Right? So this is a suppression of phase transition that actually allows the system to keep sort of some degree of freedom, even at zero temperature. When you turn on long-range interactions, that's not longer true, but it's still true that the system will uh, transport charge much more easily in the system where we have lots of uh, this degree of degeneracy and frustration. So we take this to ionic transport um, and um, study a material which is very complicated. Uh, it's the garnet, one of the sort of best materials today in the oxide family for transporting ions. And um, we try to understand that from this point of view of a sort of uh, sublattice symmetry and frustration to try to explain why certain garnets are good conductors and why certain garnets are not. And this emerged as a sort of general design rule for ionic conductivity for other materials as well. I'll show you this example. So the garnets uh, have a complicated crystal structure with all sorts of sites, octahedral, tetrahedral sites that can be occupied. And this material can be tuned in terms of how much lithium it can take in terms of the lithium content by substituting different elements on the other sides, right? So you can go from three to seven lithiums per formula unit in this material just by changing chemical composition. And as a result, uh, of course, as you'll see, uh, the ionic transport properties are very much affected. So uh, first we basically ask a question, how do we make this material as frustrated as possible? So how do we engineer this high entropy, residual, sort of residual entropy state that can transport charge easily? How do we avoid these uh, regularly ordered ground states. Uh, and the idea is uh, to first find those ordered states. And for that, we use group theory techniques to basically just classify all the subgroups of the uh, prototypical garnet, find all the subgroups that can accommodate a regular lattice, uh, lattice of lithium at a particular concentration. So we go sort of group by group, uh, projecting downwards towards sort of lower symmetry cubic and tetragonal groups to find all possible orderings that are compact enough so that they can actually be ground states. And then we basically hypothesize that those orderings are not good for transport. So without even looking into group theory, if you just do uh, ionic transport calculations with molecular dynamics, you see these kind of features that you already saw in the Ising model. Basically, in this material, certain compositions have these dips. In other words, indicative of phase transition of the sublattice of lithium. And these freezing points actually correspond to a much lower conductivity. And they exactly correspond to the situations where by group theory analysis you find these highly ordered states. Uh, and they correspond to these integer values of uh, lithium content in the material. Three, four, six, seven. Five happens to be degenerate so that you actually can have disorder there. So um, this gave us sort of uh, new materials and uh, recipes for improving in this particular case uh, ionic conductivity by telling our experimental partners to remove lithium and to make material as disordered as possible. So this was sort of interesting. And uh, taking this further into sort of screening for better materials and looking at all possible oxides that exist that contain lithium, uh, um, we started looking essentially in an automated way using ab initio molecular dynamics in hundreds of these uh, oxide compositions. Um, I'll just jump to the uh, conclusion or I guess the summary of the result here. We did find, actually, in many, many crystal structures that you pull out from ICSD database and you start running molecular dynamics, things don't move exactly because you're sort of ahead of time. Uh, a priori, you already uh, have an ordered structure, right? So the idea is to uh, make these materials frustrated by extracting lithium, by engineering these sort of frustrated uh, carry concentrations. And we do find that in this case, you know, you can make 40% of materials that don't even show conductivity, you can make them into conductors by uh, applying these modifications to the concentration of the lithium sublattice. So this is sort of a, I think, a design rule that can be um, used very effectively in actually screening materials. It turns out that the carrier concentration, the lithium carrier concentration, is one of the most important tuning parameters for ionic conductivity, especially if you're working in, in crystalline, uh, crystalline solids. So. Um, I'll just briefly mention the fact that disorder in general 
uh, in this case, frustration was sort of a sublattice disorder. But disorder in general seems to be an interesting uh, tool for engineering higher energy conductivity in, uh, in, uh, in organic materials. It seems that uh, by far more materials, when you make them amorphous, they start conducting ions better. We don't understand really why. There are some hypotheses based on percolation models, but um, you know, some materials actually do better, some materials do worse, but uh, the fact that most materials do better when they're amorphized indicates that uh, disorder and frustration materials is actually an interesting design tool uh, for superionic conductivity in general. So um, with that, I'll uh, just show you a summary of sort of materials we've looked at uh, and patented a few of these using this sort of search techniques uh, and just uh, mention that it's also not the only property to consider when you're designing materials for real applications. You also need to consider stability to water, stability to carbon dioxide, all sorts of sort of environmental issues, as well as, you know, cost of elements. And you end up sort of with a matrix like this to give to experimentalists that includes not only the ionic conductivity, but also these other properties that can be computed from ab initio. So, um, yeah, so I hope this was sort of useful as two examples of materials where you can apply ab initio tools to get to better materials in a quicker way using sort of combina combinations of models and, and screening. And with that, I'll thank you and take any questions.